Just welcome you guys all to um, the Minimal Viable Onboarding uh, webinar. It is um, really focused on getting you guys up and started using User Pilot, but then also giving you the tools to get your users up and started as quickly and as easily as possible. So we're not going to take too, too much time um, in the introduction section, but I would like to give you a general outline of the plan for today. So first, we're going to talk a little bit about onboarding as a general concept, what minimal viable onboarding is and how it fits into onboarding as a whole, um, how to actually create this minimal viable onboarding, um, and then try to figure out exactly what we're going to accomplish with it, a couple do's and don'ts, and then in the second half of the, of the presentation, we're actually going to jump straight into the user pilot app. We're going to use the Chrome extension and the web app to really start putting together literally the first couple of steps in any minimal viable onboarding. So we're going to decide if we want to build a linear or a branched flow. We're going to head directly into our key activation metrics. And then we're going to start to think a little bit about um, our secondary features. So this is our game plan for today. It should be about uh, 25, 50, uh, 25, 75, mostly building. But um, if we get focused on some serious concept questions, I will stick around there. And then, of course, we'll definitely leave some time for questions and answers. So. Let's go ahead and kick it off. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is onboarding as a general concept. And the very first thing that we need to keep in mind when we're talking about onboarding is that it is an ongoing process, right? It doesn't just happen all at once right in the beginning. Instead, when we're thinking about it as a whole lifelong process in an application, it really helps us understand how to break it down into more manageable steps and then not to be afraid of onboarding uh, customers later down in their journey. Um, hello, welcome. If you get started, we'll keep, we're going to go ahead and keep rocking and rolling. So yeah, so that's the first thing is to um, immediately start transitioning your thoughts about onboarding into uh, a thing that happens in the first day of your application into a concept that is going to be throughout the journey that your user takes in your application. The next thing we're going to talk about is actually um, that Onboarding is not a substitute for good quality UX and UI, right? We need our user experience in your own applications to be uh, pretty high quality. And then your onboarding actually just highlights and enhances that onboard, uh, the actual tool itself, right? Uh, this kind of example might be a little bit strange. However, I think it can be really beneficial. Thinking about an app like Tinder, it is by far the easiest uh, process, right? Swipe left or swipe right. However, even applications this simple do rely on some kind of onboarding because the user needs to understand what they need to do to actually get value out of the, these tools. So thinking about how can you highlight the best things about your platform and then also support the things that might need a little bit more development, but definitely not thinking that it's going to take over uh, and, and completely substitute your user experience, right? All right. So one of the main ideas that we're going to be talking about in this entire process that I think is really valuable to think about when we're talking about onboarding is how simple we need to break things down into, right? Keep your processes simple. Give them chunks of information dispersed throughout the user experience and user journey so that they can get value in small and easy to like bite-sized bits, right? One of the things that a lot of customers like to do is give their users an idea of how many steps it's going to take to get through a process, right? Nobody likes going into a 30 step process unless we're told we know, like, you know, we have to get through these 30 things in order to get value. But if you can break it down into smaller, more manageable bits, that's way more effective. And so thinking about giving your users individual tasks and moving on, individual questions and moving forward. And so keeping things really simple. And we're gonna talk more about that in the building process. So now we've talked about onboarding as a general concept. Let's move into minimal viable onboarding. So minimal viable onboarding is uh, a section of your onboarding overall. So when you think about onboarding, we're looking at users moving through different stages. So here you'll see there's an aha moment, an activation moment, an advanced, like once users become advanced users and they're adopting secondary features, and then hopefully all of us hope to have champions at the end of the day. And we'll try to talk about these uh, separate portions, but what I want you to keep in mind is that today we're talking about minimal viable onboarding, and that takes place between the initial aha moment, moment into activation. It's a process to get them from one to the next, 
secondary feature adoption and moving users into champion mode uh, actually happens a little bit later in the onboarding process. And actually, if you guys are interested, we do host an onboarding uh, or a webinar on this part of the onboarding process. And it actually takes place on Tuesdays with my colleague, Samantha, who Andy, I just mentioned, um, is usually the host of this event. So I would highly recommend if you haven't been already to definitely check that out. We go through advanced features, how to use them and how to get your users into adopting secondary features and becoming champs. But anyway, we're moving from AHA to activation. And I guess that requires us to understand what these two things are, how they're different, and how we're going to get users from one to the other. So the first question I'm going to ask you, I'm actually going to send out a poll right now, is uh, not this one. Uh, I forgot my very first question, of course. So the first question I'm going to ask is, what is activation? All right. Um, is it when a user is initially dazzled by your product? Is it when a user signs up using their email or is it when a user actually starts getting value out of the product? Go ahead and send in your answers if you can. It should be in the chat. Um, and so you should be able to see this poll. I would love to get your ideas so I know kind of where we are. All right. Fabulous. And don't be afraid to send in your answer in a little bit just because I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, start chatting about them now. So. Um, wow, you guys are smart. It sounds like you guys have either done some reading or already came in knowing exactly what you're going to talk about today. So the aha moment is exactly the time when a user uh, is dazzled by your product, right? So we know that that's not the answer because I asked what activation is. So when we talk about activation, we have to think about what the next step is. So thinking about something like Facebook. Facebook is an application that everybody knows um, what our, the, the aha moment is, right? It's an opportunity for me to connect to my friends and colleagues. It's a chance for me to uh, share stories and like comment on news, news concepts, things like that. So that's the aha moment, right? And a user can come in, sign up and enter their email and password and they're, they're already in, in the application but they haven't been activated yet. Just because a user has signed up for a program doesn't mean they're activated. Every application has their own activation metric. So Facebook's, for example, is once a user has added seven friends, that's their marker that a user has been activated. And the reason for that is because those friends are the ones that are going to allow them to actually comment, like, share. If they don't have any friends, they don't have any way to do that. And so they actually give you easy ways to add friends, they ask you to connect different things. So they're immediately trying to push you to add as many friends as you can. So that's the difference, right? The user comes in excited about the, the offerings that the tool is providing, but then you have to move them into the slot where they're actually activated and can start using your platform in a beneficial way for them. All right, any questions about the AHA activation split? It looks like you guys are already pretty clear on that, but it is good to just check in every once in a while. All right, so when we're, we, since we know we're trying to move our users from AHA to activation, what are we going to accomplish with a minimal viable onboarding process? And the first thing that we're going to hopefully accomplish with this is increasing your activation rate, just getting users to that activation in a, in a faster, more efficient way, hopefully to increase your numbers of users that are actually activated. It's gonna help you introduce your key features. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. And it's gonna show you contextual tips for user navigation, right? So we're getting your user through this initial phase, getting to know your application, but in an effective way. So thinking about that, how are we gonna increase our activation rate? We're gonna focus on key actions, the things that are gonna get your user to actually be able to use your tool. So I, give, I like to use this example because hopefully most of you guys are in either trial or um, you're already paying users and just hoping to learn a little bit more about how to get more value out of user pilot. So you've seen this screen hopefully. And what it is is telling you that in order for you to get value out of this tool, you have to install the Chrome extension, right? As soon as you log into user pilot for the first time, this is one of the first things that you see and it just is a single button that says, click here to install the Chrome extension. You need it to get value. And in case you didn't notice, there's no X button on this baby. You have to click it. It navigates you to the Chrome store. Uh, and we really, really push you towards that activation metric. So start thinking about what those key actions that your users have to take in order for them to get value are. Make a list, figure, you know, think about that so that when you go into the building process, you're always working towards that goal. Next, 
is we're introducing key features. And I just mentioned that previously, you've got to take key actions. And oftentimes those key actions actually live in your platform, in your features, right? And so if you're thinking about um, you know, Gmail or any mailing subscription uh, website, for example, and this is what we're going to build towards today, just as an example, uh, if you're signed up to Google, they're her, their key action is sending an email. So you want to point out where users can go to actually start sending those emails. And they should always be goal oriented and have a clear audience. The first reason is that they need to have a clear audience is because some of our applications have different goals for different user types. Maybe an administrator needs to accomplish different things than a general user does. Um, maybe the accountants on one uh, team need to do certain things where your um, sales managers need to do another thing. It's completely dependent. Also, uh, focusing on new users and old users, right? Maybe uh, in minimal viable onboarding, we're focusing on new users, but you'll want to be mindful of that so that when you're later building for new features, for example, you're introducing new features and you're hoping to get your users activated towards those. You can use the same concepts in minimal viable onboarding and target older users and say like, hey, you've been around for a while, but you haven't used this great new feature that we just rolled out. So always be thinking about who you're building for and uh, what your goal is at the end of that. Any questions up until this point? I'm rocking and rolling through here. So uh, let me know if you want me to slow down or ask any, or if you have any questions, all right? Okay, so now we're getting into some more advice that might be a little bit surprising. So we really encourage you to build short experiences. And the reason for that is that users don't love to have to click through a lot of steps. And what we've actually found is that if you have a lot of steps, oftentimes you're adding unnecessary uh, friction to get your users into that activation point, right? Just get them to the goal. Uh, if they have to send an email, have them click here, open here, press send, like don't, you know, you don't have to add 30 additional steps that navigate them all over your application, right? So we usually recommend around three steps. Now, I understand that in some of your web apps, you do have processes that do have a couple of additional steps. So if you and I have an onboarding call and I catch you with a seven step experience, I'm not gonna kick you off of user pilot. Um, I just always recommend that every single time you add a step, you're thinking, is this getting me closer to my goal? Is this necessary? All right. Now we're thinking about targeting our audience, right? Because we wanna make sure that our users are uh, exactly the audience that we have in mind. And we're gonna talk a lot about how to do this once we jump into our web app. And so you're gonna be thinking about who the, what kinds of attributes are gonna be valuable for you to target these users. Is it their sign up date? Is it their plan? Uh, what are your custom events? And we're gonna talk a lot more about this later, but always be thinking about exactly what your goals are and who that audience is so you can target them directly. So now we're thinking, what kind of onboarding do I have? Do I have a linear flow where everything has to happen in a certain order and I want my users to get kicked off from here? Or do I have a branched flow? Can they kind of choose their own adventure, go through uh, a couple of different processes, even though all three will lead them to an activation in one way or another. These are your key three key features, for example. Um, it doesn't have to be three. Um, and so you can give your users some choice so it's important to think about which, which side of the spectrum you're in. And this can change. You might find that initially you think that you're branched, but then you really need your users to do one key thing first, and then they can choose between two or three other options. And we'll talk a little bit more about how to do that. For example, user pilot does this, right? We really push you towards that Chrome extension installation, but then maybe you exit out of that Chrome store. We, you're back in the application. We give you time to play around. We point out some other features in the, in the meantime, but you've always got that checklist kind of looming in the background telling you, you have to accomplish this task in order to get value. So that's something to think about. All right, couple do's and don'ts, and then we will rock into the builder. Do like these are do's for you first. So do install the user pilot JavaScript. If you guys are currently in your free trial, or if you're new users, the sooner you get this JavaScript installation in, uh, the better. And also, uh, we say any other way possible because you do have other options. You can install with Segment. You can install a couple different ways. And we have tons of documentation if you'd like to pass it to your developers um, about how to do this. But the sooner you get this in, the faster you're gonna see how valuable user pilot can be for you. Do add 
custom events, and user identification parameters. I'm going to talk about this because, uh, like a little bit later, but in order, like adding custom events and user identification parameters is pivotal, not only for you to target your users, but also for you to analyze how well your users are adopting your features uh, and figure out where you might have some holes where you can go back in and say, you know, after a couple of weeks, if a user still hasn't adopted one of these key features and you can see that in your custom events that hasn't occurred yet, you can go back in and like I said, we talked about it being an ongoing journey. You can scoop them back up later and just keep checking in and helping them really get to that adoption metric. All right, so how are we thinking about custom events? Custom events are oftentimes things that can happen at different stages in, in your user journey. Sometimes it's a thing that needs to occur right away, installing the Chrome extension or the JavaScript. Sometimes it can be something that's done later. So for example, in user pilot, we really encourage you to build segments, but it's okay if you don't have segments for the first couple of weeks because you're really just getting your toes wet. You're figuring out what kinds of segments you need. So those can be secondary features. And so you might want to spread out what your expectations are kind of along the spectrum. All right. You do want to add identification parameters, and this is very similar to the installation of custom events. Custom events, I like to think about them as true or false metrics. Has it occurred? Has it not occurred? Um, have they added a credit card method for payment? Have they installed the Chrome extension? Have they installed the JavaScript? Either it's occurred or it hasn't, right? But in um, identification properties, you can look at who a user is, right? Their name, their role, their company ID, um, their plan, all of these things. And you can also look at how frequently a user is accomplishing a goal, or you can look at dates. And this is really helpful because you can think about things like, um, for example, in an application where you have to create invoices. Sure, the first invoice is really valuable, right? But if they've only sent or if they've only created one, that doesn't mean they're activated, kind of like the Facebook metric. They have one friend, doesn't mean they're activated. So I want to count how many friends they have so I can say, after 30 days in my application, if they haven't created more than seven invoices, I'm going to reach out to them again and say like, hey, you know that you're here for invoices, right? Like, let me help you. So thinking about all of these user identification properties. And what I always recommend is digging into your application and saying, all right, so what are my goals? Who are the people that have to accomplish these goals? And how can I get this into my JavaScript as soon as I can so that I can start tracking this information? We've got a question from Noah. All right, for new customers onboarding with um, different HL tours, not interactive ones yet, <laughs> do you have recommendation on the number of levels to avoid tedious guidance, um, still show around the features that can help? Yeah, absolutely. So first, because you have different roles, this is going to be super critical, right? And what's really helpful, actually, just even psychologically, the user knowing that you have built a custom guide and, and walkthrough, um, interactive walkthrough or checklist that's specifically for them helps them recognize that they're not going to be shown features that are irrelevant to them. And uh, one of the things that I recommend is actually to split your guide up into individual features. And maybe you can build it into a checklist and say, like, check out these different um, tools that are going to help you get set up. You know, obviously, our recommendation is really getting users into using your tool. And so teaching, but I'm going to get to this in a slide, but we'll get there anyway. Um, teaching by doing. And so saying, like, we're going to show you how to get the most value out of the following features because they're relevant to your role. And as you do them, you'll actually get to build them and set them up. And so um, definitely. Be, they become less tedious when they're actually getting something out of it. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. So building experiences per page and per view is critical. One of the things that does become super tedious is walking through a platform that's like, and here you have leads, and here you have communications, and we're going to walk you through. And that's where you get the 37 steps. That's where you get the okay, okay, okay. Instead, take them directly into leads and then show them the valuable things in leads. Take them directly to the conversations and show them the things that are valuable in conversations, but they should be split up based on their goal. And we've, you know, we've talked to, I feel like I'm, uh, I repeat myself a lot in this because all of these concepts really go hand in hand. All right. And because they go hand in hand, what I just talked about where you're like jumping through all of the different pages and, you know, click here and click here and click here. All of these product tours that I'm sure all of us are super accustomed to at this point can become so monotonous. And the other problem is that they are uh, 
not good for learning. Uh, imagine like getting a, a piece of Ikea furniture uh, all broken up and then somebody from the store says, well, first you'll have this part and you have to plug it into this part and then you'll have to use a hammer to add this and then you're going to do this and then you're and then they just walk away and you haven't built any of the Ikea furniture. They've just shown you all of the different parts that you have. That's not helpful at all. Instead, I want an interactive guide to show me first, take this piece and put it with this piece. Great, now that you've accomplished that, we're gonna build this part, now do this and this, and in the end, you have a full thing. But I've gotten to go through it step-by-step step in little chunks that made sense. And that's how learning works. Um, just like a side note, I actually uh, previously was a teacher. And so part of a lot of the way that we think about this actually comes from just truly the methodology behind education and teaching and how users learn best. And so product tours are really not lucrative learning tools. Instead, using interactive walkthroughs where users actually get to use their hands and accomplish things and understand how things work is exponentially more, uh, more effective. So keep me up. Know if I didn't answer your question so far, let me know and I'll, we'll retouch uh, on it when we're in the building process, but just keep me posted. All right. Now, in minimal viable onboarding, we really want to avoid looking too deeply into secondary features. Sometimes it can be beneficial to sh mention that they exist. However, especially with more complex tools, you really want to avoid this. You want them to get set up as quickly as possible using the baseline tools. And then after you can see that they've adopted these, that's when you introduce the secondary features, right? Uh, obviously, all of us, I'm sure, are super accustomed to Gmail, but I like to use it as an example. Imagine you're teaching your grandma how to use Gmail. She doesn't probably need to learn how to schedule an email for three days in advance with um, hyperlinks and images and connected to things in Google Docs and Google Drive, right? That's too much for her first email. First, you just need to show her how to add her recipients, her subject, and then push send, right? That's what she needs to know. Obviously, you don't have to dumb it down for all of your users, get them where they are at. However, you really definitely want to ensure that they are adopting your simple processes first before you take them into the deep dive of every single thing that your platform can, can be used for. We will, and what's really nice about using minimal viable onboarding is that as soon as they get set up and ready, they're going to see how much value those walkthroughs had for them. And so then when it when another one comes later, they're going to be more trusting of the fact that you're going to provide them value. And so you can touch on these uh, more advanced features later on in their journey. All right, it's time to build. I promised I'd get you here. So um, first things first, I'm going to ask you guys if you want to build a linear or a branch flow. Both of them are super easy to set up. And so they're kind of interchangeable. If you see one built, you can figure out all, it's pretty easy to figure out how to build the second one. Um, the next thing that we're going to talk about is building into a key activation um, event through that flow. And then we're going to segment on and target our audience. And then we're going to talk just briefly about secondary features. Um, so I want to know, that's not what I want to know. I want to know, nope, also not what I want to know. Okay, let's do it. So it's asking you guys what uh, type of onboarding you think you're going to be using. And while this poll is going, I'm going to switch my screens around. So if you want to, to see something that may not actually be related to your kind of onboarding, that's fine. Just click that one. But I'm happy to build whichever one. And depending on if we have time, I might build both. So now I'm going to switch screens. I'm going to pop over here. And we're going to go ahead and build, build, build. Linear, branched, don't know the difference. Totally reasonable. All right. So. I'm just now loading my Chrome extension. Feel, feel free to stop me. The building process especially uh, can be really helpful um, to stop and ask me questions because A, we just launched a brand new Chrome extension. So it is still uh, new to a lot of people and new to me. So I understand if you wanna pause there. And then also um, if you just have just general questions about why and how and when to use something. So. Um, there's two parts of user pilot, right? So I'm just going to jump into the dashboard so that we can see it. Um, so there's two main sections in user pilot. First, there's our web app. And, you know, she's beautiful. She's shiny. She's new. She's getting updated all the time. So you'll see some new fun things. Um, and in the web app, this is where you're going to do uh, most of your segmentation. This is where you're going to look at user data and look at user analyses, um, your growth insights and set goals. I would like to talk about this um, more specifically in just a moment. So we'll get to, to, to kind of the an, an analytics section um, in a little bit here. Um, but then this is what we're going to be focusing on today is your engagement layer. And we're going to be focusing more specifically on flows today, but we might touch on spotlights. 
Um, and then in the advanced features webinar, they dig into checklists, the resource center, um, NPS, just with all of the other fun stuff. But flows is really the main concept here, but I probably will sneak into uh, spotlights and checklists anyway, because I just think they're super valuable. So um, what the way to build, uh, like think about user pilot is as soon as you're ready to build things, you're going to actually pop into the Chrome extension. And the best way for, in my opinion, to do that is actually just navigating to your web app. So this is my fake web app. I'm going to really quickly log in and log out because the um, I don't know if any of you guys have used a Heroku app before, but they can be a little temperamental. So I'm going to just log out really quickly. And I'm going to show you guys how to just really easily start building. So we're going to imagine that this is your first time and you've never built before, but I, I imagine that most of you guys have. So I'm just going to really quickly uh, trigger my Chrome extension. And it, as long as you're logged in in your um, dashboard, you should be able to uh, log in directly from here. And now you're ready to start creating content. This is uh, it's super simple. And so the first thing you're going to do is navigate to the page where you want to actually start building. And this kind of goes back into that concept of where I mentioned to uh, build per page and per view. If you want a flow to start on a specific page, you need to navigate there first just to make sure that um, A, in the building process, it's a lot easier. Um, but B, it's you have to think about the fact that you're building for your user to interact with it. And so um, you want them every step to be basically uh, mimicking what they're going to go through. So if this is their landing page, the user lands here, this is where you should start. And minimal viable onboarding, generally speaking, always start with a welcome screen. And this welcome screen generally should either lead them into a direct path, which is their linear um, onboarding that then takes them directly into their uh, first thing that they need to accomplish in your application and or a branched path, which basically means you provide them a couple of options and regardless of what they choose, they're gonna start getting value quickly. So it looks like most of you guys chose branched and the linear one is uh, just like a simplified version. So I think if we want to go back and relook at a linear one, I'm happy to do that, but I think we might as well start with a branched flow because it is quite easy to do. So I've navigated to the homepage. This is where I wanna start. So I'm gonna go ahead and click start here. So now I have to choose if I want to build a flow or a spotlight. And as I mentioned, flows are the ones that are going to be your in-app walkthroughs. Um, and then spotlights are going to be more static tools. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. So we're going to create a flow. I'm going to name my flow uh, just because the default for your flows is going to actually take the name of the location in which they are. And so if you don't change the name, you're going to end up with a thousand home pages um, pretty quickly. It happens to me uh, all the time. So I'm going to go ahead and name this my um, uh, MVO, Minimal Viable Onboarding Welcome. And it's going to be in the new user onboarding category. You can uh, choose your categories uh, once you're actually in the web app. And I can show you what that looks like in a little bit. Next thing you're going to look at is this is the build URL. You don't have to change this at all. It just tells uh, the Chrome extension where you started building this so that it can take you back to that page so you can build again. And then you choose your theme. And just really quickly to point this out, you can configure as many themes as you'd like uh, directly here in the themes tab. And so you do, when you first sign up to user pilot, you get two like st standard themes, but then after that you can add more themes and you can edit them directly here. It's really nice that you can see a preview of your different themes. So for right now we're in the Samantha theme. And so you can see what this will look like if you want to just preview that, but this is where you would are. And you can create new themes directly here and you have access to custom CSS. So for example, I made uh, a transparent um, CSS flow. So I can add videos and things that'll just be transparent directly on top of the off, on top of the application. Um, and so this is just custom CSS. So that is there. So this is where your theme is selected and you can choose that from here. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and click create. And just in case I did realize I minimized my chat. So I'm gonna pull it up really quick, just in case people are asking questions that I'm missing. All right, so here we go. So now we're going to talk a little bit about each UI pattern. So we have uh, four main UI patterns. Most of our welcome screens 
my recommendation is that they start with the modals. There are announcements, they're centered on the page, they call attention to the user. I think they're the best for welcome screen. You also have a couple more, and I might as well talk about them while we're here. You have slide outs, obviously kind of clear with the name, they come out from this side. And I think these are excellent for surveys. I think these are great for feature announcements. I think that these are great um, for like small subtle requests. I think that those um, work really, really nicely for that. Also, what's great um, with slide outs is if you have a, a UI that has kind of some blank space in some sections and you want to provide some information um, so that the user can work while they see the slide out. So perhaps you can give them like tips to fill in um, certain pages or, you know, any, any, if you have a video that they can watch while they work through something um, on a single view without the page refresh, you can have that slide out. And so the user can interact and it's not taking up. It's just there in the kind of blank space on the page. So that's great for slide outs. Tool tips are really important when we are pointing out uh, information. They are there to give the user, provide the user information uh, and tips. However, they do not push a user to take action. And that's where driven actions come in. Driven actions and tooltips look very similar aesthetically. Uh, however, driven actions give the, push the user to actually take action. And we're going to see why these are so valuable. So let's go ahead and start with our modal. Now, you can choose a template. Um, you can build out your templates in the app. You can take one that's already built and then edit it and save it into your own, um, which is really nice. And there's tons and tons of different ways to, uh, to choose yours. So for example, just to show you how simple it is, imagine you think you want to start with a single, uh, a single onboarding flow, right? But then you decide, actually, I can make this branched. It doesn't have to be linear. Very, very easy to modify. So we can go ahead and take this and we can completely delete it. Or if you want to add new sections to it, you can do that as well. So I'm just gonna actually uh, remove this little button here. And why won't you let me go? Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just add it here instead. We'll do that. So I can add one button here and I can add a button on the side because I want it to be two buttons. And now I can delete this guy because I don't need it anymore. And oh, I deleted the wrong one. See, I'm still learning this guy, like this new Chrome extension brand new to me. <laughs> well, it doesn't want to work with me right now. I wonder if I can slide it. No, she doesn't want to play. Well, for the time being, we can look at it this way. I'll figure this one out on, on my time. I don't want to waste yours. Um, but so you can immediately switch that. Or what's really nice is should you change your mind and you want to uh, change your template, you can go back in and select a different template at any time. And so knowing that we want to build a branch modal, you can just select one that already has um, multiple options and say we only want two. Now we can, in fact, uh, hopefully, we'll see if it works for me. Yeah, delete it and add, and now we just have two. So why is this important? We want to make sure that our users are going through two equally important paths. So this is your opportunity to first welcome the user and tell them that you're super glad that you're here. So you can obviously modify all of this and welcome your user. You can also, what can be really nice is you can make your um, products, if you're passing the correct attributes, you can personalize things. So if you wanted to say, um, you know, hey, David, for example, or hey, Andy, you can let, welcome that individual user and uh, make that personalized if you're passing that attribute. So something like this. Now we're going to add our personalization here. I'm going to choose an attribute and I'm going to choose name. And if I want to have a fallback, I can add that as well. I can say, uh, we are so glad you are here, right? So just in case the name doesn't populate for some reason, they're still uh, jumping in here. And so I can say, hey, name. Uh, we want to kick off this onboarding in style and so on and so forth. That's how you guys get the idea, right? So you're editing all of this. You really want to capture your user's attention and then convince them that this onboarding is worth their time. Push them into um, your application as quickly as possible. So for example, our template kind of does this for us. We say we want you to set up a company. You can onboard your new hires and you can automate your payroll. And so if you have these three sections, you can immediately choose which path they want to start on, if they want to start by setting up their companies, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is something we didn't talk as much about in the presentation, but I think it's really important to say now. I believe 
all of your flows should start and finish with the action that you have in mind. So the purpose of this flow is just a welcome. That's the purpose. I don't need to then have the um, next button take them to the next step. Why? Because each of these buttons, one is set up my company and one is onboard an employee. The flow that's going to kick off when they click those buttons should start with the very first step in setting up a company. It shouldn't start with the welcome modal. And the reason for that is so that if I wanna use it in a checklist later on or in a native tooltip or trigger it some other way, it's not gonna suddenly start with a welcome screen that's no longer relevant, right? And so if you start it just with the, um, the flows that are actually relevant, it's gonna save you a lot of time. So right now, let's imagine that we've made this super beautiful, we've decorated it, just to show you a couple of interesting things that you can do. You can um, make this, uh, if you have multiple steps, you can make this a progress, uh, you can allow a progress bar, but this isn't something that we're gonna to wanna to do here. Um, you can modify your placement. So right now I have it censored at the top, but maybe I want it right in the middle, I want it towards the bottom, um, just depending on the different types of UI that you have. So I'm gonna leave it here in the center. And now um, you can also modify your box. So you can say how rounded the corners you want, you can do all of this. And if you want the box to have a border or not. And all of the other things that you, if you want to make modifications, you can absolutely change anything within the, uh, within the theme section as well. This is just a little bit more aesthetic. And you can save this template should it be something that you wanna repeat using exactly the same way. And uh, if you, for example, make announcements on a regular basis about changes in your application and you wanna save the template uh, for that modal, this is a great way to do it. And then you'll find it in your templates from that point forward. A couple of things, skippable step. See this X button here? I like to think of this as they don't have two options, they have three. And I don't want them to have that third option because it's basically allowing them not to make a decision, especially in a welcome modal. You're here, I need you to choose one of the two ways. You have to get value somehow. I don't want you just to exit out and decide that you don't wanna play. So you can, you can decide what you want this to do. So right now it's automatically set to exit flow, but you can make some other choices. You can have it dismiss the group. So if you have multiple um, other steps, for example, if this was an announcement and then you have a couple of um, release notes for it and it's all together, you can just uh, dismiss this individual one and then just keep going. You can skip step and continue flow, dismiss flow and never show it again. Um, but another one that I like is dismiss flow and show in the next session. So they can close it out for now, but next time they come, it'll uh, reappear for them, for example. Um, and you can dismiss flow and discard the entire category. And if you'll recall, I have this in the new user onboarding category. So if I really want my user, uh, if they want to opt out completely, I might put in little parentheses, you know, in, in one of the notes, it says, if you would like to dismiss all future onboarding, um, press the X at the top right corner and they can exit out of onboarding. Not my recommendation, but just letting you know that you have this option. But my personal preference, take away the choice. It's gone. Now they have to choose one of the two paths. So that's the first step. Now, also you can turn on and off your backdrop. The backdrop is valuable because it will prevent your user from interacting on the application until they've choose, chosen a path. So they can't click out of this until they've chosen um, a path that they'd like. Um, all right, so now we have two buttons. I need to build the flows that are going to be tied into these buttons. So I'm gonna go ahead and just go back to navigation. I've gotta move my zoom controls here put these down at the bottom. So we're gonna go back to navigation. And now I'm actually gonna start building new content. And I want to actually start with a new, a new piece of information. And we're gonna modify all of this in a little bit. So I'm gonna create new content. And now I wanna start with the flow that's gonna take my user to the very first major activation metric. So in my fake application, the very first thing I want them to do is navigate to the inbox and uh, create an email, their very first email. So we know that they are, they are still here on this landing page. And regardless of where they are in my application, the very first thing I'm gonna need them to do is generally speaking, I'm gonna need them to navigate into inbox. So my first step should be the first thing that customers have to do. So I'm gonna go ahead and click start here. I'm gonna create a flow. I'm gonna name it, send an email, and it's gonna be in the new user activation, all this good stuff, create. Now I'm gonna select my UI pattern. This is going to be a driven action because I want them to drive into clicking inbox. So I'm gonna select here. Now it's gonna ask me to select my actionable um, tool and I have to choose what I want my user to click on. I want them to click on inbox. So now 
it tells them what they need to do. So I, I tell them like, click, click here, right? It doesn't have to be too crazy. I can modify this, manage your notifications, whatever you wanna do here. And the same rules apply, right? I can um, decide if I want this to be a skippable step or not, or do I want them to click in? Do I want this to have a backdrop? If it has a backdrop, they can't uh, click into anything else. But if I want them to be able to navigate into something else, that's entirely up to you. Um, you can also modify your beacon if you want to change it from an arrow. You can make it a line. You can make it a ball, etc. You can have a nice um, blinking beacon and or you can have a, a nice little uh, click here emoji. Um, and you can modify your box corners, shadows, etc. All that good stuff. And you can also change um, your different uh, individual actions, elements, things like that. So right now the action is a click. We want my user to click here. Um, the behavior is that they click on the selected element at which point the experience can continue. Um, you can uh, choose, depending on how your CSS selectors in your own applications uh, work, you might need to use manual element detection, which will tell you the actual CSS selector that it's found, and you might have to make some modifications here, but that's entirely based on your own application. Um, placement. You can choose where you want this to be. So right now I have it over here on the side, but if I wanted to have it um, towards the top or something, I could also select that. Um, I liked where it was. So I'm gonna leave it just as it is. Now, we're gonna go back to navigation. So I'm thinking my very first step is that the user clicks here. So now I have to follow my user there. I have to follow their actions. So I'm gonna click here. Now, I know I said it in my onboarding, avoid page changes when you can. But if you do have to navigate through two pages, think about the fact that your user needs to be the one that's in charge of the navigation most of the time. Um, the reason for this is that user pilot likes to follow the user into whatever path they want to take. Um, and you want to ensure that if the user is navigating somewhere, that's where the flow continues on. And so this is going to be a silent redirect. It's just going to silently follow your user to the new location. And what you'll notice is, um, do you want to start a new flow on this page or add a page change? We want to add a page change. And now it'll tell you, I've got a nice silent redirect. It's just going to follow you here. Forced is going to actually manually change the user's URL. And uh, it, this can become a little bit dangerous if your users uh, have, for example, queries or um, dynamic URLs. Unless you're passing things as attributes, it can be a little bit difficult for a user pilot to predict an unknown character. So silent, silent redirects are definitely the way to go. So now we've got our... our um, Page change, I'm gonna go ahead and hit save. And now I'm, I have to move my Zoom thing again. <laughs> and now I'm gonna add another step. So I said I wanted my user to click compose and start building their email. So I'm gonna have them use a driven action and they're gonna select compose. And now exactly the same process, I can make the modifications as needed. I'm gonna go back to navigation. They're gonna click compose. Now here is just a little bit of personal preference. In my opinion, most of our users are smarter than we give them credit for, and we don't need to tell them to exactly what they have to do in every single line, right? If they, uh, if I have a tool tip on every single one of these and they have to click next, 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 they're gonna be so bored of me so quickly. Instead, why not just let them know that this is what they have to fill out first and then wait for them patiently. So for example, I could use a driven action text input, which is uh, waiting for the user to start typing. So let's just show you what that looks like. I'm going to add a native tooltip after group or to the group actually. And I'm going to select this guy. And that's going to be here in the text area. And what I want it to be is you're going to find this, I hope, very cool. Uh, I'm going to switch this side really quick. Let's modify this placement so we can see it over here. And then I'm actually going to switch sides with this guy. So now, what I mentioned before is the behavior. I want this to actually be fitness. I don't want it to be a click. I want it to be a text input. So when my user actually starts typing, then they can actually move on. And it can show um, the next button and that is everything that I need it to do. So what you'll notice is that uh, as soon as they start typing, a next button will appear. And then we're gonna let them go to the last step because I don't need to tell them every single thing. I can put that information directly in here. I can say, make sure that you add all of your recipients. And if you'd like to CC anybody, feel free to put that information in. And the last thing I'm gonna wanna do is I'm gonna add one more driven action to the group. And it's gonna be a simple, actionable, hotspot right here on send. And so what we're gonna do is the behavior is actually going to be 
I want it to be right here. And I want it to, where are you? Action, here we go. I want it to be a hotspot. And so now it's just a pulsating beacon, letting my users know that when they're ready, this is where they need to save. All right, I've gone through this entire process. It's very quick, but did you notice? Short and sweet. So now I'm gonna preview this just to show you guys what it'll look like. And I wanna preview the full flow. It's gonna navigate me back to my starting page. So it know, like this is where the user's gonna start. So I'm gonna start with them. I'm gonna wait for my, um, tooltip to load and there it is it's telling me I need to click here so I click here I've navigated over here now my user is going to tell me I need to click compose I'll click compose I need to start typing the names of my users so I'm going to type this to Andy and I'm going to hit next and now I can continue typing everything that I want and it's not going to bother me it's just a nice little pulsating beacon down here on send and so that as soon as I hit send the flow has been completed and my mail has been sent to Andy at no email so Super simple. Now, how do we connect these two things? Very easy. We know that we've named this uh, the email one, and I know that my previous flow was my minimal viable onboarding welcome flow, right? So I've got send an email and minimal viable onboarding. So I'm going to pop back into that previous flow and just connect it to the button. So simple. If any questions come up, I'm checking the chat all the time. You guys are very quiet. <laughs> So I'm going to go ahead and click here and I'm going to say send an email instead. And now you've got this great little button link over here. And what I can do is instead of it going to next step, I'm actually going to have it trigger a flow. Trigger flow. And the flow is going to be the one that I just built, send an email. And I'm going to go ahead and hit submit. Now, just to show you one really cool thing that you could do. You could modify this to let this be branched and allow your user to opt out. So you could say something like, um, show me next time. And now what you can do is you can modify the button color to make it kind of look like its own background, which is um, kind of like this. And now, ooh, that's not what I want, like this. And now I'm gonna hit save. And now I need to modify the text color to stand out a little bit. So we can slide it over here, for example. And we'll go ahead and hit save. Why aren't you working for me? Might be just my laptop is being a little bit wonky. So now that way your user kind of knows that they have an option to get out and we're just gonna modify that link and you can just say um, dismiss flow and that's that. And I can add additional information. I can track that users have asked to dismiss this. I can make this uh, just actionable for me later. So in three weeks, I can say, hey, you dismissed the flow, but you haven't set up your email yet. You know, what's going on? So things like that. And that's it. So now we've built our welcome flow. We've built the first um, onboarding process. -y. And imagine now I've spent another two hours building out all of my different flows and I'm ready to start publishing them or at least testing them. So I'm gonna go back to navigation. And now we're going to get out of the builder and go into the settings. And that's where some of the real cool stuff happens. So we're going to go ahead and pu hit publish. Never fear from hitting this pink publish button. The pink publish button uh, will always navigate you to the settings tab. And that's where the real publishing occurs. So don't worry too much about that if you are in the process. All right. So now I'm here in my uh, settings tab and you can access this directly from your flows section. If I go into uh, flows, I can see all of these settings directly in. you don't have to go in through the builder. However, I think it is really nice. You'll see both of my new uh, flows that I just built are here. And so I'm going to take a look and I'm just going to explain all of this stuff on this page because I think we have the time and I think it's really valuable. So I've got the title and uh, while there you do see this little pencil, you just have to click into it and you can just type um, if you wanted to modify any titles directly here. Now you've got your build URL. Again, you don't have to modify this. This is just where you built it. It's just going to navigate you there when you want to make modifications to the flow itself. So you can always go back to the place that you built it. Um, and you've got your category. And like I said, you can make modifications to your category here. Now, domains. Domains are really great if you have multiple domains. So for example, in uh, Heroku, I have mine, which is Galisa at Heroku, but are at user pilot. 
but Samantha has her own, Antoinette has her own. And so I might need to specify that I only want this to trigger in my specific domain, for example, but that's entirely up to you. You don't, you, if you want to pass things, uh, for example, if you have staging environments, you can um, specify that you only want it to launch in your staging for now. And then when you're ready, you can flip it over to all domains and make sure that it triggers there. Totally up to you. Pages. Um, if you want a flow, a welcome flow to trigger from absolutely any page, perhaps there is another way for them to land on uh, on a flow from or on your application from another location, and you still want them to be welcomed. I would recommend having it set to any page. Similar to my um, driven action series, because that side menu is available on any page, I would recommend having that set to any page. So I'm going to go ahead and turn that on. Um, just a heads up while you are here. If you do have, for example, if this uh, referral was a query or something, you could modify this. And so you could say something like if, if this was referral slash equals whatever, I could modify this and make it an asterisk. Um, and so what this allows me to do is then change this to matches rejects and just say, it doesn't matter what this is, this is unknown, but as long as this entire domain and dashboard processes is, is correct, you're good to go. So that's something to keep in mind. You can also obviously play around with this and we have some great documentation on page settings. Um, triggering priority is a setting that isn't used that frequently, especially because we're using, we're hopefully using segmentation a lot more often. But what this allows you to do is trigger flows um, if you have two like flows. So for example, a welcome modal and an announcement. And you want to, uh, they have the same audience, the announcement is gonna go to new users too, but you wanna decide, I really want my uh, welcome to come first, then you would just set it to high because they're, the triggering priority that is like set to normal is the most recently built flow is the first one to trigger. So in this case, because they have the exact same audience, the um, announcement would, would trigger first because you built it more recently and then your welcome would appear. So that might be a little bit wonky. So you might just want to set this to high. So if they have like audiences, this one's always going to trigger first. Um, but that's entirely, it's not very commonly used. Um, and now this is your audience. This is where the, like the good stuff gets put together. Now, obviously you've got your all users. Great for announcement. It's great for, you know, pretty much a lot of things. Um, and then Next, you can either choose only me. This is not just only you. This is anybody that has your Chrome extension installed. So anybody in your team that's actively working in user pilot, you can, uh, they can see the flows as well if you, if you set it up this way. A specific segment. Um, I'm going to show you how to build these segments, but what's really cool about this is that you can build out these segments here in your people dashboard, and then you can have it here to choose from uh, at any at any time. So I can build out my new segment or my new signups, for example, or you can build it on the fly. And the only reason that I don't always recommend building something on the fly is that that just means that all the things that you want to build for this specific group of users, you're going to have to build it here. And that just, uh, it's a little bit of a waste of time, but if, if for, for announcements or things like that, if you want to build it directly in here, I say, go ahead. And so what we're looking at are the things that we discussed in the beginning, who your user is, why are you targeting them? What is the purpose of this? So I could say, I want this to go to user identification. Let's find ones that are in their role uh, is um, admins. And I want, I want only admins here. I also only want free trial users. So let's say um, plan is free trial. And these are all attributes. And let's add one more because they are in their free trial, but maybe I have a 60 day free trial and I only want this to be for new signups. I can have this with signed up uh, less than let's say 10 days ago, for example. So they're new signups, they are in their free trial and they're administrators. Tons of awesome stuff here. You can also, you know, for example, for the email flow, you could set that for users that haven't sent an email, right? We want to just focus on those users. So you can do that and that's with custom events or user attributes. Um, Voni asks, if we ever publish accidentally to the public, how do we delete it? Don't delete the flow. Don't give up. You just, uh, for example, if I click publish right now, it's going to publish and I'm like, oh no, I don't want to publish it. Unpublish. It's gone. It's fine. <laughs> it was, it's easy to modify or, and, and just take it away from your users. Um, another thing that you could very quickly do is just change your set, like your segments or something. And so you could say, I actually, I only want it for me and then republish it 
then it will only trigger for you. It won't go um, to your users again. So you know you don't have to delete the flow. But if you want to build a flow and then you later want to delete it, I'll show you how easy that is. Um, and so now we've got our users that match specific condition, <laughs> conditions. So we've got all this set up here. Now we need to think about our frequency. How often do we want this uh, welcome screen to trigger? Welcome screens, in my opinion, should only go once. It's the like, hey, welcome to the application. We're so excited you're here. So I say only once, but you can have things trigger every time. This um, can be a little bit on the uh, irritating side, but if you have an application where a user needs to clock in uh, and they need to uh, edit their timesheets every day um, or every time they log in, that's a great way to say like, hey, don't forget to trigger your timesheet or you know, absolutely anything that is relevant here. Um, or you can keep triggering until a goal is met. Now, how will they, what's the goal? You have to set it. So if we say, I want this to trigger until the goal is met, then you would set this goal and it will continue to pop up. So uh, great for, um, you know, if you have, if a user needs to send this, if they've built the invoice, but they need to send it, you can say that the goal is their first sent invoice, the custom event invoice sent has been, or like invoice created has occurred. And so then you can set that, you can either choose an existing goal, that one that you've previously built, or same thing as segments, or you can define a new goal directly here. And I can say, I want this for custom event, add invoice has occurred. And so this is going to continue to pop up until the invoice has been created or the email has been sent or, you know, whatever you'd like. But for this guy, we're just going to have a trigger once and I'm uh, not going to set a goal because it's not relevant. However, things to think about for goals. If I turn on my, my goal definition and I want this, let's imagine that this flow is specifically set to target invoice creation, I can run an A-B test that easily. I can immediately compare of the users that saw the flow to help them create an invoice, how many of them successfully were able to create it? All right, um, I didn't miss it, might miss this. Is there any way to test um, in my client only in uh, JS2 without, um, without adding it to the server side? If, if I'm understanding the, correction, the question correctly, you can install the JavaScript only in your developments, uh, in your development area or your sandbox area, and you don't have to put it in your production application and that way you can just test in in your sandbox and then later if you decide to eventually take it live to your customers your team would just need to add it to uh to your product side um, if that answers your question all right we only have two minutes left i feel like i got you through most of this stuff um the only other things that we're missing here is building segments and uh creating goals and actually that is all gone over in the advanced features webinar as well and it's super easy to do you just pop in here and start adding those um those features that we were talking about those identification parameters and then you just save it as a segment and that's it it's super easy so if i wanted to create a segment for only new signups less than 10 days ago and i want them to be all admins and so i'll just say roll is admin now i've created a segment and that's that i don't have any because my users aren't real but if i click save segment that's it and then i'll find them directly in my segments and it's just here in this drop down menu and you build uh your goals in the exact same way instead of choosing these attributes you're going to be choosing the custom events all right questions you have a minute and also, I will send you an email. I will follow up with you to make sure that we um, answer all of the questions you have at any stage in this process. Nothing? Anything? I don't want to keep you too long. OK, wonderful. Well, if there are no questions, like I said, I'm going to follow up with an email. Um, if it doesn't come out today, I, my colleague Samantha has the list of who all attended today. So she'll probably need to update me and then we'll send that out tomorrow. But I'll send you tons of information and you can feel free to reach out to me. You can reach out to your um, account executives, Celine, uh, Selena, excuse me, or Judeen. Absolutely anybody uh, in the customer success team, we're all here to help. All right, it was wonderful to speak with you all and meet you all today. Have an excellent rest of your day and we hopefully will um, talk to you again soon.